Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, thanks a lot for invitations. So really honored to speak for the seminar. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the joint work with Paul Dario. He was a PhD student at uh, Ecole Normale, now um, a postdoc at Tel Aviv. Um, so the talk is going to be about the villain model. Um, but okay, let me just use the first slides to, to mention that it actually belonged to a larger class of models called the abelian spin models, namely the spin models where each spin took value in some abelian group. So other examples are including the XY model, the clock model, abelian Higgs model, abelian lattice gauge theory, and so on. So our hope is that the, the, the method we've been um, working on can also be adapted in this uh, broader class of models. Now, okay, let me start with, um, with a um, gentle introduction. Um, so for, first for the classical XY model, it's gonna be a Gibbs measure defined um, so that the spins took value on unit circle. It can also be parameterized uh, by the angles. Now this Gibbs measure has the Hamiltonian, which is the uh, inner product of the uh, near, nearest neighbor spin on the circle, or you can write it as this uh, cosine of theta i minus theta j. So um, spins are sort of favored to align with each other in this model. Um, it's, it's been used as a mathematical toy models for some novel materials like uh, liquid heliums or uh, insulator superconductor extensor. Um, so, okay, so we first write down this Gibbs measure on the finite graphs, um, but there has been uh, works, there has been some uh, correlation inequalities, such as the Geneve inequality, which tell you that if you include more edges, have more and more open, you open more and more edges with positive couplings, there is some universal some um, monotonicity of this measure so that you can, in fact, took the infinite volume limit. You can send uh, this um, lambda to the whole infinite lattice DD, you got some well-defined Gibbs state on the infinite graphs. And this is kind of the object that we're going to work with throughout the, the talk. Now, the XY model is certainly a very uh, famous, very classical uh, model but it's maybe not very easy to handle because of this e to the beta cosine function. So this motivates Villain, the physicist, uh, to introduce this following approximation using the fact that when beta is huge and theta i minus theta j is small, you can approximate this, this function by a periodized Gaussian, namely you have this uh, Gaussian-like thing, but you wrap around over the circle, sum over all the two pi times the integers. So another way to interpret this guy is that this is the heat kernel on the unit circle. And now if you replace this e to the beta cosine by this heat kernel action, then what you can roll down is this new Gibbs measure, which is uh, called the Villain model. So it looks a bit nicer because now you have some periodized Gaussians, but still because of this, um, the spins are taken value on the circle, it's kind of periodic. So this interaction is still highly non-convex, has infinitely many local minimums. So there still presents um, enormous challenge um, to understand the large scale behavior of this model. Now this XY and Villain model are believed uh, to have a very special kind of phase transitions. So normally, as we know that mathematically you can characterize the phase transition in terms of the uh, symmetry breaking. For example, if you cool down um, you know, a glass of water, make it into ice. And in that case, you lose the perfect rotational symmetry of your water molecules and you become the lattice. However, in two dimensions, this X1 Villain model are so special that the uh, continuous symmetry is not expected to be broken at all. And in that case, you can only characterize the phase transition by looking at some uh, topological variables, such as the uh, vortices. So we will sort of define that uh, later on. And this very special kind of phase transition is called the Kostlitz-Stylitz transition. 
and has been a very instrumental for uh, designing novel low dimensional materials. And in dimensions three and higher, however, it behaves differently. So you do expect symmetry breaking, like at very low temperature, the spins are tend to align with the preferred direction. However, because of this continuous symmetry, one expects that there is a macroscopic fluctuation from this preferred direction, which are given by something called the spin wave function. So mathematically, this spin wave function can be described in terms of some kind of a Gaussian free field. Okay, so to be um, more precise about uh, these uh, predictions. Um, so in, okay, sorry for this handwriting. So in two dimensions, we expect no symmetry breaking at any temperature. There is a critical temperature believed to be eight pi. So below which, well, okay, below this beta, you expect exponential decay and then above which you are in constant solid space, which should be characterized by the uh, algebraic decay of two point functions. In dimensions three and higher, you expect that uh, there is a critical temperature such that, um, you know, if you cross this critical temperature, things changed from exponential decay to a long range order. And in this long range order phase, one expects that this thing subtract this expectation should have, should give rise to some Gaussian free field uh, fluctuations. However, the mathematical justification of such phase diagram is far from complete. So up to now, we only rigorously know things where beta is quite small or beta is quite large. So for example, for the small beta, if beta is less than two beta e thing, there is this eisenman simon proof, which show you the exponential decay. On the other side, so in low dimension, in two dimensional case, low temperature will not have two bounds, which, okay, basically doesn't match each other. So there are upper, upper and lower bounds for the two point function in terms of power law, but with different power. So this is done by a McBrien Spencer for the upper bound um, in the, in the um, 70s. And very recently been, uh, this bound has been improved a bit by uh, Christoph Gabba and Avilio. Um, and the lower bound has been obtained in the seminal work of Froelich and Spencer in the 80s. But the precise asymptotics in this space is uh, still not improved. Now in dimensions three and higher, however, um, we, there is a proof uh, for the existence of long range order at low temperature. And then there are some quantitative uh, refinement, um, which we will also go into later on uh, in the 80s. Frelick Spencer and Brickmon and other people um, who gave some bound for the truncated two point function in this space. Now in the paper with Paul, we obtained for the first time the precise asymptotics of the truncated two point function in dimensions three and higher and low temperature. Now let's uh, be a bit more um, concrete. So as we um, know that in the you know, first of these works in this uh, dimension three and higher are done um, in terms of you know, using this uh, famous infrared bound, which says that if you look at the asymptotic two point function, it is bounded below by one minus two G zero over beta. G zero is the inverse Laplacian of uh, ZD evaluated at zero. Now we know that when dimension is three and higher, this G zero is gonna be finite. So if you took beta large enough, this quantity is going to be uniformly positive. In other words, we have the long range order. Now, the next natural question that one might ask is what would you expect for the uh, asymptotic behavior of the two point functions? So a heuristic description of this asymptotic behavior can be done by using the so-called spin wave approximations. So namely that um, you ex people expect that if the beta is very large, the temperature is very low, you would expect that your spins are tend to be quite aligned with each other. So theta i minus theta j is very small and therefore this um, cosine 
can be extended and it's roughly equal to a quadratic function. Now, if you replace this by a quadratic function, then you are just approximating the X, Y of the Lin model by a Gaussian free field. And then for Gaussian free field, you can compute everything. For example, the two point function, you can give an exact computation given by this. Now this computation gave you that in two dimension, you have, you expect a power law decay with the power minus one over two pi beta. And in dimensions three and higher, you expect it um, behave like first you have a constant depending on beta, then you plus one over beta over X to the D minus two. Okay, so however, this um, spin wave approximation is only sort of qualitatively correct. Um, we do expect power law here, constant plus power law here, but the exponent here and the constants here are not gonna be the right exponent and right constant. So the reason for the spin wave failed to give the correct uh, description is that it ignores the occurrence of the vortices, right? So because our spins are taken value on the unit circle, one expects that around each face, you could look at um, how the spin changes. So in fact, uh, like location here, you do have a vortex appearing on this face. And here you do have an anti-vortex appearing. And the interaction of this vortex and anti-vortex will actually also contribute to the large scale statistics of the spin model. So um, this has been first mentioned in this work uh, by Kostlitz and Saulis. So I'm not going into detail of their argument because it's, um, it's quite non-rigorous anyway, but what they suggest is that the vortex, anti-vortex interactions are behave like a neutral coolant gas, okay? And therefore you can understand the phase transition of your spin model also in terms of this vortex binding transition of the coolant gas. At some point, the, the vortex are quite tightly binded with each other and in, other and in the other cases, it's gotta be um, quite separate like a plasma. Okay, so based on these um, Coulomb gas description, so they made the conjecture that in the low temperature case in two dimension, if beta is bigger than the critical temperature, you expect the two point function to still behave like a power law, but not with the Gaussian power. So you expect that this exponent will have a contribution from the vortex interaction. So it's gonna be like one over two pi beta effective for some uh, effective um, temperature. Now, what, um, what McBride and Spencer showed is that you do expect an upper bound for the two point function in terms of this uh, Gaussian power of decay. And in this upper bound is in fact also um, improved um, by um, Christoph and Avilio um, recently. So that, that you do expect this uh, two point function decays faster than what you expect in the spin wave. And also in the low, temp low temperature case, Froelich and Spencer obtain a lower bound of the two point function, which is different. You have a different exponent than what you have from the upper bound, but these two things are gonna be asymptotically match as beta go to infinity. And therefore we sort of know that as beta go to infinity, this um, spin wave uh, prediction is gonna be accurate, but this conjecture still remains to be largely open for any finite beta. Okay, so that's uh, the situation in two dimension. Now, what we have in three dimension is that one expects in the low temperature, we can write the two point function first as this magnetization square. And then you have this one over X to D minus two term with a constant appearing here. This constant will be different from what you get from a Gaussian computation. It incorporates also this 
interaction of the vortices. And then you have a lower order term. Okay, so there are works in the 80s, uh, for example, in another paper of Freud and Spencer, they obtain a Gaussian upper bound and they can also have some uh, lower bound, which is different, but as beta go to infinity, it's gonna be asymptotically like the upper bound. And the people also studied what was called the transversal spin wave. For example, you can think of, um, you can take a large box, you can put the boundary spins all aligned in the same direction, let's say the X direction. You look at the infinite volume state by took the infinite volume limit of such measures. And then if you examine the Y component of the spins, this can be written as the sine-sine correlation and it's called the uh, transversal spin wave. So in this uh, brickmont fontaine lebowitz sleep spencer paper, they show that when the temperature is low enough, this transversal correlation is gonna be bounded above and below by constant divided by x to the d minus two. Now, um, what um, in the paper uh, with Paul, we successfully um, proved uh, this conjecture for dimensions three and higher and low temperature to show that uh, you do expect that the uh, truncated two point function behave like a constant divided by x to d minus two plus a lower order term. And in particular, the constant here is gonna be different from what you obtain from the Gaussian computation. But um, okay, the difference is in fact, as we can show is, is quite small. So it's gonna be like exponentially small in beta, much smaller than the leading term one over beta. And we can also obtain the, um, the asymptotic, um, the asymptotics of the uh, transversal two point functions. This is also going to be behaved like a constant divided by the x to the d minus two plus a lower order term. Okay, so this is our main results. Um, so what I have next is uh, describing the strategy of proof. So before that, are there any questions uh, so far? No questions apparently, everything is okay, very clear. Good. <laughs> Continue. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, okay, let's uh, go ahead. So this, um, right, as we have mentioned, this uh, Villain model, it has a very non-convex interaction. And therefore we're not really working directly with this Villain uh, model. And in fact, the proof relies on some um, existing works first. Um, first, there is a dual argument, duality mapping by Frock and Spencer, which maps the Villain model to some uh, Coulomb gas, neutral, neutral Coulomb gas uh, model. And then one can perform a cluster expansion when the temperature is low enough to um, obtain a random surface model, which is, has non-local interaction. Um, and finally, we're going to use uh, the PDE technique, and in particular, the recent uh, developments of the uh, quantitative stochastic homogenization to study the scaling limit of this uh, random surface models. Okay, so let's uh, step by step. So the first step is that um, is gonna be a description of this product Spencer argument. And uh, we will see that one can in fact make this um, prediction by costlets and stylists rigorous. And you can factorize the Villain measure in terms of a Gaussian free field measure times a neutral Coulomb gas measure. And then all the difficulty are gonna be lies in the study of the Coulomb gas measure. Okay, so how does uh, this work? So we're in dimensions three and higher. So unfortunately we need to talk about differential forms. Um, okay, the, the, the dimensions three and higher, you have zero forms, which are function defined on the vertices, one forms function defined on edges, two forms, for example, those uh, vortices are function defined on faces. And there are also three forms. They are exterior derivative, co-differential, and Laplacian acts on these forms. Now, um, for simplicity of the argument, 
we're actually using the following identification. So for example, you can identify every vertex with the three outgoing edges. Okay, and therefore you can think of a one form, which is a function defined on edges to be in fact a function defined on vertices, but with vector value. So at each vertex, you have a function which has a three component basically. So you can also do that for the two forms, right? So you can associate um, each vertex to three faces so that uh, two form is gonna also be like a three component function on each vertex. And with such identification, we can have the usual um, operators um, on, on this um, vector valued functions, the gradient operator divergence curl and the Laplacian works um, normally. So it maps the function to function. Also, if you act Laplacian on the, on the vector valued function, it gives you vector valued functions. Now, another ingredient that's going to be important to us is this uh, Helmholtz Hodge decomposition, which says that you can decompose a vector into a potential field, which is then co free plus a divergence free field. Okay, and in fact, this is an orthogonal decomposition, right? If you integrate this and then you do an integration by parts, you would see the cross term is gonna give you zero. Now, um, also this um, divergence free part can be written explicitly in terms of the curl of V. Okay, now how does this uh, duality step work? So you start with this uh, Villain measure. Now, first I can exchange the summation and the product. So this is going to be the summation over all one form M, which we identify as the vector value, the functions on ZD. And now what I'm going to do is I'm, go I'm going to split this sum over M. So I'm going to first sum over all the possible vortex configurations on the faces. And then I'm going to sum over these M, which lead to the particular vortex configuration. And now for the second summation, I can do the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition. It gave you that such M can be decomposed into a potential field plus the divergence free part, which can be written out explicitly. Okay, and moreover, this is an orthogonal decomposition. So if you replace such M with this in the measure, you see that because it's an orthogonal decomposition, this quadratic function actually can be decomposed into um, first, you have this um, potential adding to grad theta, and then you have the other divergence free part. Now, um, one can in fact combine this potential with grad theta, theta defined on circle, to make it into a potential of a real valued function. And that gives you a Gaussian free field measure. Okay, and the other part, if you rewrite it, you would recognize it gave you a Coulomb gas measure such that you have the constraint that the divergence of Q is zero. Now, in fact, in dimensions three and higher, this is gonna be some local neutrality constraint, which tells you that your, your charge is Q and it's the charges at your, um, some of your neighboring faces have to sort of cancel each other out to give you this um, divergence free condition. Okay, so this is uh, the factorization. And then we will focus on understanding this uh, Coulomb gas measure. Now, in this part, we are going to follow, in fact, an argument in the um, notes of uh, Roland Bauerschmidt to use some cluster expansion in, um, and rewrite this Coulomb gas measure in terms of a vector valued random surface measure. It, this, 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 particular, um, this particular Gibbs measure looks pretty much complicated. It includes a lot of uh, non-local interactions, but in fact, it's gonna be more amenable to study than the original Coulomb gas measure. 
Okay, so the starting point is this uh, famous sine Gordon representation so that you can rewrite your Coulomb gas partition function in terms of the expectation of a Gaussian free field. Okay, and then before we, def we describe this duality um, for the, um, for the uh, partition function of the Villain model. And in fact, you can also do this um, for the uh, two point function of the Villain model as well. It becomes the two point function of the Gaussian free field times this ratio of two partition function of the Coulomb gas, where this uh, numerator has an extra observable sigma, which is given by the potential created by a plus charge at zero and minus charge at X. Okay, so this is gonna be the, um, expression for the numerator. Now, the other thing, now what we can do next is we can decompose the Gaussian free field. As we know that the Gaussian free field can be decomposed by the sum of two independent Gaussian fields. One is a local field with covariance uh, square root beta identity. And the other one is a non-local field, but rather smooth. And now if we integrate out the local field, you actually get some kind of uh, contraction here, right? So th th there is this contraction factor, which is uh, small in terms of um, when beta is large and when the um, L2 norm of this Q is large. And then you have this um, expectation with the remaining Gaussian measure phi one. Now in dimensions three and higher, because of this um, local neutrality constraint, the Q actually sort of cancels out um, a lot. And therefore it is possible to sort of split this sum into a disjoint sort of disjoint um, into sort of disjoint, uh, you know, clusters of charges, which, um, which are sort of have disjoint support and then perform some cluster expansion when beta is large. So after doing this, you can in fact uh, observe this, you absorb the summation into the exponential, you get the ratio of two such expectation here, where Z is a factor which is exponentially small in terms of uh, beta and also in terms of the L2 norm of Q. Now, what can you um, do with that? So you can rewrite this measure on the denominator, right? So, um, so okay, this thing, you can rewrite it in terms of a new Gibbs measure where you have this law of phi one, which is already non-local like this, plus this um, factor that you have on the exponential. So this thing is gonna be another perturbation term came out of uh, cluster expansions. And then one can do some uh, trigonometrics to, um, to rewrite uh, this um, numerator. And then it's gonna be, um, you know, you, in, you can identify the ratio of these two Zs in terms of a quite complicated observable with respect to this uh, non-local measure. Okay, so what's the point of doing that? It looks uh, quite complicated. It took the whole slides, but in fact, um, it's not that bad because first of all, you see um, this measure mu beta, the leading contribution of mu beta is like a Gaussian free field. And then on top of that, you have two terms, both of which are perturbations because when beta is large, this term is going to be exponentially small if your range of interaction is uh, very big. And also this term as well, because Z is going to be exponentially small, both in beta and in L2 norm of Q. So this also gives you um, that, you know, this um, long range interaction is gonna be exponentially small in terms of the distance. So eventually this is a perturbation of the Gaussian free field. And moreover, because the Q satisfy this low neutrality condition, this means that the whole measure is gonna be only depend on the gradient of phi. So this is the gradient phi Gibbs measure. 
such that um, it's also a being a perturbation of the Gaussian free field. Okay, the, it's different from the usual um, gradient phi measure because um, it's gonna be vector valued. It took some value has a three component. Okay, so now this is um, this is looks very complicated. Now, in next slide, I would like to explain why heuristically that you expect um, this um, complicated um, expression give you the right asymptotics of the uh, two point function of the Billet model. So here is something completely heuristic because um, for beta sufficiently large, very low temperature, you expect that your plus and minus charges of this, you know, these vortex charges are gonna be tightly binding with each other. So it's, it's gonna be look like dipoles. So if you replace Q by all the dipoles, nearest neighbors. So this phi q becomes just the gradient of phi. And if you further think that, you know, the sine of x is approximately x, you can in fact um, just approximate this complicated observable by a constant z times phi zero minus phi x. And therefore this Coulomb gas contribution would be essentially like a Gaussian free field expectation of e to the phi zero minus phi x. So that would give you another contribution, which is behaving like a constant plus a constant divided by x would be minus two. However, this, this part is completely heuristic because Q for at any finite temperature is not exactly a dipole. There will always be long range um, charges um, that came into the picture. And the measure we have mu beta is not a Gaussian free field, it's a perturbation of that. So in fact, these facts would also come into play and change the constants um, you obtained after, um, after doing uh, this computation. Okay, so um, now let me go to the last step is going, um, the last step is to describe how we are gonna study this um, complicated expectation under this non-local Gibbs measure. So the two ingredients on the high level that we need to use are the first one, this link, which is called the Helfer-Sjöström representation, which uh, links um, the Gibbs measure with a certain elliptic PDEs. Um, this is um, first laid down by uh, in the seminal paper of Nadav and Spencer. And then there is um, this uh, quantitative stochastic homogenization developed by Armstrong, Kusi, and Murat in recent years, which allows us to understand the large scale properties of the PDEs. Okay, so let's. Um, start uh, to describe it. Now, because the model is very complicated, let, let me first illustrate how to do it in the simpler case, a much simpler case, which is the grad phi model, right? You have a Gibbs measure such that your um, Hamiltonian or interaction is given by V of grad phi. V is a uniformly convex function. So the upper and the second derivative is bounded uh, away from zero and infinity but uh, it's not a Gaussian. Now, um, you can make sense of the infinite volume limit of this measure as well as done by Funaki and Spong. Now, when V is quadratic, we know very well how to understand uh, this measure. It's a Gaussian free field. So the covariance is uh, gonna be given by basically the inverse of Laplacian. And then we know everything about uh, this Gaussian free field. Now, what can we do when V is not quadratic. In fact, there is something similar, but uh, more elaborate um, to explain. Now, um, so to describe what's happening then, we need uh, to introduce uh, these few derivatives. So this, suppose you have a function F of your random field. This partial XF is gonna be describing the derivative uh, with the phi of x, okay? Now, 
you can also talk about the adjoint operator of this partial X after doing this integration by parts. So in fact, this adjoint operator is gonna be given explicitly uh, by this formula. And now you can define this uh, so-called the Witten Laplacian. It's gonna be the sum of partial star times partial X. It's gonna be given by this. And when observe that this uh, delta phi operator is in fact um, self-adjoint, right? So you, you can do integration by parts with respect uh, to the Gibbs measure. Now, um, probabilistically speaking, this delta phi is the generator of the uh, Langevin dynamics of your Gibbs measure so that it uh, leaves your uh, Gibbs measure invariant. Now, this, um, so now given this delta phi operator, let's introduce another operator, which is called the Helfer-Sirstrom operator. It has this delta phi, okay, which is uh, some kind of an infinite dimensional elliptic operator. And then on top of that, I'm going to add it with a usual uniformly elliptic operator. So these operators are just acting on your lattice, which has D dimensions. And A here is gonna be the second derivative of your V of the grad phi on that edge. So in fact, um, because our assumption, this is going to be another standard uniformly elliptic operator. Now, the helper strand uh, representation basically tell you that the, um, this operator will tell you a lot about the correlation of the field. Um, now, in fact, you can also describe how you solve an elliptic PDEs with this operator, this infinite dimension operator. Just like that uh, the harmonic function minimizes the Dirichlet energy, you can also solve a such um, PDE by using some variational characterization, right? So the solution is gonna be defined as the minimization of some more complicated energy term like this. Uh, excuse me, uh, yes. what is phi in the helper schoen operator? Okay, so this, um, yes, so, uh, if you look at uh, this equation, actually your function is not just uh, uh, defined on the, the spatial variable. So all of your function here would depending both on the space and on your random field. Okay, so this both this uh, G and the calligraphic G would be function which has infinitely many variables. It has uh, this spatial variable and this field variables. And also your coefficient of your um, operator will also depend on the field variables. So this is an equation which, you know, basically you should understand this equation happens, um, is something that you need to equate x by x and phi by phi. So this is the equality at every spatial point of your lattice and at every possible field configurations that you have on the lattice. So that's why um, in this operator, you also have phi's, yes. Okay. But you. eventually we're going to take phi to be the original Gibbs measure and taking expectation like this. So in particular, if you want to understand the uh, covariance of your functions of phi's, now what you do is you took uh, field derivatives of f, you took field derivative of g, and then you invoke this Green's function corresponding to this Helfer-Sirstrom operator by looking at the solution of this um, this PDE L of calligraphic g equal to this partial x g here, and uh, in this way, you obtain the covariance of your Gibbs measure. Okay, so this is um, done um, by in this Nada Spencer paper. Now, and so this sort of um, translates the uh, statistics of your random field in terms of PDEs, right? And therefore it would be natural to expect 
that the large scale property of your random field can also be understand in terms of the large scale property of the PDEs. And uh, it is in fact true. And so therefore the um, scaling limit of uh, your random field can be also obtained uh, if we understand the following uh, result. So suppose uh, that one can show the solution to the um, health assistant equation looking like this. So this, this uh, G would be like the Green's function that corresponding to the health assistant operator. So if we can show that um, on large scales, the solution here would be quite close to a solution of a standard harmonic equation with a constant coefficient a bar such that the difference of the um, original um, Green's function and the limiting Green's function is gonna be much smaller than um, the typical Green's function in D dimension, then this would tell you that, um, that the uh, covariance in your original model is gonna be very close to the uh, covariance in the continuum model, which is like a Gaussian free field and uh, with the quantitative uh, description of the error term. So, so a statement like this, which says that, you know, this, um, this um, PDEs, which um, such that the coefficient depending on some random field on large scale behave like a PDE, which has a constant coefficient, it is uh, usually called the homogenization. And in fact, we are need to do this um, homogenization in a way that you can quantify um, the errors. Okay, so basically um, first the link between this um, PDE and Gibbs measure and then how the homogenization came into play goes back to this work of Nadav and Spencer. And then there is uh, this work of Jan Komi, Ola and Spong who gave a probabilistic um, interpretation of that. And um, in the paper um, with uh, Scott Armstrong, we actually, quant we actually gave uh, some quantification of this argument of Nadef and Spencer. Basically, we are able to um, prove some um, quantitative rate of convergence um, between the original equation and the limiting equation. And we use that to, um, to obtain um, some uh, regularity. Um, so basically we proved that the surface tension of the gratified model has the C2 regularity, which has been, uh, which is an open question that, have been, that has been raised by Funaki and Spong. And um, so in this paper, this work uh, with Paul, as you see, we are not really just having this uh, gratified measure. We have something much more complicated with that. So we need to extend the existing techniques to the case that the operator we have is gonna be have this long range, infinite range operators. And also because we have a random um, surface model such that uh, your height function is not real valued, but has three components. We also have to extend these techniques to the systems of elliptic equations. Uh, excuse me again. What is the definition of the calligraphic L operator? So this is the uh, health assistant operator, which uh, which is defined here, right? You have this okay. um, this plus this, yes. And uh, and uh, the, and the, the exact definition of the health assistant operator is it easy to uh, to explain? Sorry, the exact the, definition of this the, thing of of the health health assistant operator. Yes. So it has this part, which is this uh, delta phi with Laplacian, which is defined uh, like this, okay. right? And on top of that, it has this standard uh, uniformly elliptic operator on ZD. So, okay, so, so is, these gradients are acting on this, this on your lattice. So delta phi is, is just the, the Laplacian in five variables. Right, this is on five variable, and this is on the spatial variable. And what what is the Hilbert, what is the Hilbert space that the 
Laplacian supply axon. Okay, so this is uh, some kind of uh, H1 space, but it's an H1 space uh, such that, you know, it, it's the H1 of functions which define both on this spatial location ZD and also on all possible uh, field configurations on ZD, which I wrote omega. It's basically some very large H1 space. Okay, then, then you can solve this PDE by looking at uh, the minimizer of all these uh, functionals belonging to this large H1 space. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Right, so we mentioned the, some of the difficulties, this infinite range operators, and we have elliptic systems. And normally many standard uh, elliptic estimates for example, the George Nash estimate would actually fail in general for the elliptic systems. So in fact, we need uh, to also develop uh, something new in order to understand um, the scaling limit of this um, particular um, random surface models. And so the new idea that we have is that we are in fact, um, borrow some uh, perturb perturbative idea from the Schauder theory from PDE. And in fact, we observe that this um, Helfer-Sjöstrand operator, it's very now, you know, in our case, it's gotta be very complicated. It's gonna be of infinite range. It's gonna be a, with an elliptic system, but we know that when temperature is low, the leading term of that operator is going to be given by a standard Laplacian and then plus the perturbation of that. And therefore, if you want to understand the solution with respect to this operator, there is this perturbative idea you could use to say that the solution on large scale can be approximated well by the solution of the, of the solution with just this operator, which is harmonic functions. And therefore it should have uh, regularities almost as good as the harmonic functions. For example, harmonic functions, we know the gradient decays like gradient of Green's function. And therefore this, this solution should almost be, you know, the same, except maybe the exponent is a little bit worse by some epsilon, but when beta go to infinity, this epsilon is gonna be tending to zero. Okay, and then as we've seen before, you can describe the solution of the PDE variationally as the minimization of some energy. And therefore to understand the convergence of the solution of the PDEs, we can also took this variational point of view by, um, by looking at the convergence of the energy functionals like uh, what uh, was done in Armstrong, Kusi, Murat and in my previous paper with Scott Armstrong. And um, so you can, in fact, uh, look at these energy functionals as a function of domain, and then use uh, some uh, quantitative uh, stability ergodic theorem to, to understand the convergence and to obtain the convergence rate. Now, in order to obtain a rate of convergence, typically we need the knowledge of the mixing, right? You need to know how your random field decorrelates in very um, distant spatial blocks. And this will be quite instrumental in order to prove a rate of uh, convergence um, on large scales. And to understand how the, the mixing works, we, can, we basically took an additional field derivative to the Helfer-Sjöstrand equation. And then we obtain some equation for the partial derivative of G here with another complicated operator. So this equation, we call it second order Helfer-Sjöstrand equation because it's gonna be a, the one obtained by after taking the partial derivatives. So this operator is very complicated. However, we can still write that when beta is large in terms of the standard Laplacian operator plus a perturbation term. And therefore we use the same reasoning to say that this partial Y of G has almost as good the regularity 
as the standard um, harmonic Green's function so that this one decays like a gradient of the standard Green's function. So this actually would give you an algebraic rate of mixing and um, it makes it possible to study the uh, quantitative uh, convergence of your um, original solutions. Okay, so actually this is um, my last slide uh, prepared. So um, maybe I'll just, just stop here. Um, okay, so thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. Are there questions? Uh, yes. So, oh, sorry. Go on. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh -huh. So, what is the situation about the XY model? Is it yeah, harder it's a very or good question? Yeah. Right. So, um, so there is uh, some part of the proof which um, mm -hmm. doesn't. Um, completely uh, translates to the case of the XY model because this, okay. Uh, there is this part uh, in the duality part that you have, um, sorry, I'm still trying to find, yeah, here. So it's very crucial that when you have um, this uh, quadratic function, mm -hmm. then um, basically this, this orthogonality of the decomposition tells you you can factorize out into a into this square plus another square. So it gave you a perfect uh, decoupling of the Gaussian free field and the cooling mm -hmm. gas. Mm -hmm. So this would not work mm -hmm. if you have an XY interaction, mm -hmm. uh, cosine of uh, theta. Right. Um, whether there is a hope uh, to study the XY or not, I think there is hope, um, but um, yeah, but it would be um, again, um, pretty, you know, pretty premature to say anything concrete uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's like um, maybe there is a hope to represent uh, the XY model as um, some kind of a mixture of this uh, Villain model. And then we can, um, we can carry out uh, something similar, but more elaborative to understand what was done for the XY model. Yes. Um, so so do, do Frelich Spencer use this kind of approximate and description to okay, prove so, this, yeah. Um, so the result of Bernick and Spencer certainly apply to the, um, to the um, XY model yeah. as well. Um, yes, yes. But, okay, the thing is their um, duality is uh, slightly different from uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. So they are proof actually using the model, which you know uh, takes the duality of this um, these models x y and Villain to some solid on solid models, and um, and then the question is to show these uh, solid non solid model has um, the variance comparable to what you should expect in a Gaussian free field, like the discreteness mm -hmm. is not uh, mattering so much in that case, and that proof is kind of robust um, in terms of the spe specific potential of the solid on solid um, so that they obtain results for both. Yes. Um, but again, to make, um, make that approach um, precise to say that that solid and solid model exactly has the scaling limit as a Gaussian free field, uh, this is still quite open. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Christophe. Yes, um, th thank you very much Hi. for the talk. I just had a question oh, about you. the, so you, you obtain this, uh, this constant which deviates from the spin wave uh, by, by very little, by this exponential minus yes, C beta. Yes, right. And so the, so you, so this is a question I asked some while ago to, uh, to Paul also. So since okay. this uh, effective constant is not the, the C1 over beta, do you have right. some uh, lower bound here? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so at the moment, we do not have uh, anything uh, concrete here. Um, I mean, uh, 
yeah i mean it's like you need to go and uh, like into all the constants of the proof and sort of check it um so you mean there could be some magical constellations that would that would make c1 over beta equal to cf or okay that, that, that... I, I think we have a bound which is like this uh is a positive <laughs> like you i mean it's like if you have an exact cancellation it should corresponding to um to some of the uh, constant like equal to each other or something you know after you homogenize and 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 that i think is not that i think is doable to show yes but uh, in order to say how much they differ um yeah i we do not have uh, so much idea like um yeah like you have to uh, look at all these um, homogenized constants and see how much they are they differ from each other um so 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 i don't have a concrete answer here yes okay. thank you thank you further questions No other questions for the record. Uh, yes, a little bit stupid question, but so uh, the, I'm totally new to this, all these I, techniques of homogenization and everything. So sure. it looks like it uses all the tools from PDE and everything. But anyway, uh, is it, did, could you expect that this works for the VLAN model before really proving it? <laughs> I mean, this looks like a, really difficult, hard work, but were you optimistic before proving this? And, well, yeah, um, so. I mean, in a way it's, um, mm. it's one of the uh, quite robust method, right? So it, mm. from, from my point of view, homogenization is, um, is one way of another way of doing renormalization. It's like you expect renormalization group is a very um, very um, robust tool. And I think similar things should also um, happen for um, homogenization. So as long as, at least in the case where your, um, you know, your interaction is log concave so that you have an elliptic operator, then I think in, um, yeah, I think you, it's quite robust in many cases mm -hmm. that you expect. Uh, um, <clears throat> of course, we um, in the beginning we didn't we sort of underestimated how uh, technical this um, this whole thing would be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I have a related question, if I may. Sure. About the link with the um, renormalization group. So in three dimension, I, I don't quite know what they did, but in two dimension, they were worked by uh, Kadanov et al. Who, uh -huh. who showed that the, the way uh, beta deviates to beta effective is by something quite explicit, which is exponential minus pi squared beta. So do okay. you see the kind of uh, explicit constant in your technique, like this exponential minus C beta, the, C in front of beta maybe could be captured by a, by such RG techniques and maybe by yours also. <clears throat> so what I mean yeah, here is a very good question. I I um I guess I need to well I need to go back to this cotton of argument because I didn't I didn't know precisely what uh, that is. Um it um Yeah, I mean, okay, so maybe it's quite planar, I don't know. Um, it, I, <clears throat> in, in my recollection, it's not too planar. It's something like I when see. beta is very large, it's okay. very costly to put the vortex. Yes. And uh, basically, the exponential beta is 
the cost of putting one vortex and then the cost for the, the way the spin wave adapts to it. Something like that. I see. Okay, that sounds very That's interesting. Yes. Um, so, so with, with our value, we, in some sense, we have the lower bounds to what you have here in the 2D setting, not the upper uh -huh. bound, but the lower bound. I see. And okay. In some sense, we have this cadence of bound, but we don't have the upper bound. So you have that in your paper or? In the paper, yes. I but see. The lower, okay. the the lower bound. Yes. Right. Yeah, yes, that, that will be something very interesting. I agree. Um, to see in a three dimensional setting as well, yes. And yeah, so not only we have the lower bound, but it's also not in 3D, it's in 2D. So the two things are completely complementary. Sure, sure, yes. Nice. Right. Yeah, it's a nice argument, I guess. Um, okay, I think it's worth the, um, yeah. So I will try to figure out what this kind of argument exactly is and maybe get back to you. But but at the moment, I, well, I, I, I don't know whether it would work or not. Um, this is okay, is there another question?